<laughs> All right, well, welcome everybody. Happy New Year. Welcome to our first virtual road trip of 2022. I'm Molly Berry with ATS and it's my pleasure to welcome you on board today. So last year you may have joined us on some of our plant and production webinars. We went behind the scenes of an asphalt plant and an asphalt paver with TJ and Steve and we learned how asphalt is made and how it's paved. And then we learned the seven habits that asphalt producers and pavers use to ensure a successful operation. So today we're gonna to learn how to identify and prevent segregation in the mix. So before I introduce Steve and TJ, please turn your attention to your attendee controls at the bottom of your screen. I'm sure everybody's used to these by now, but just a reminder, you're all in listen only mode. If you'd like to join the conversation later, um, you can raise your hand and time permitting we'll unmute you so that you can address our panelists. And you can also type your questions or comments in the Q&A box at any time. So today's co-pilots are TJ Young and Steve McReynolds. And TJ has been in the industry for over 40 years. He's our production manager at Duval Asphalt. And he also continues on his speaking circuit and consulting company with Tesco. Steve McReynolds has been in the industry for over 20 years and 15 of those he spent with the Florida Department of Transportation. He's our director of operations at ATS, and he is also contracted by Duval Asphalt as the quality control manager. And I'll be your tour guide, and I'll address any questions at the conclusion of our trip. So I assume your luggage is stowed and your seatbelts are fastened. So Steve, I think we're ready to depart. Sorry about that. Hey, we got TJ in there now, I can see. So back to where I was, uh, segregation. This is uh, some, I'll give you some examples of segregation out on the roadway. Here's a uh, segregation in the wheel paths. It's, you can see it's already starting to rattle, causing problems with the roadway. Uh, the pavement looks like it's in pretty good uh, good shape. It's not oxidized. So this is happening relatively quick, quickly. So we haven't gotten the full life of, out of our roadway. Here's a picture of end of load segregation. Just keep this picture in your mind because we're going to talk about this shortly. Um, it's a pretty extreme uh, example of end of load segregation, but uh, something I've seen before in the field. Uh, some more examples of segregation. You can see a picture here. Um, you'll look right in the middle. You have some, what we'd call fine aggregate, and then to the lower part of the screen, and then uh, in the upper middle, some coarser aggregate. So the mix is truly segregated here. We have the fine aggregate in one part and the coarse aggregate in another. Another example of some segregated mix and actually here's some of the coarser stone was sticking up and has been crushed by a roller, which isn't good. Another example of segregated mix towards the bottom of the screen is your coarse aggregate and up towards the top is, is your fine aggregate. So truly segregated. Another example of segregated mix, this is up against a curve and gutter. So um, might have had issues to the outside of the screen with segregating the mix. So what we're going to discuss today is uh, the topics here on the screen, common causes, inspection practices, prevention, what to do if you find it on your project, and also talk a little bit about clinkers. So common causes. Um, unfortunately, we first discover, most of the time, we first discover segregation out on the roadway. Um, we could have people, uh, an army of people at the plant looking at every truck, you know, maybe we could catch it before it went out there if it occurred at the plant. But right now I'm going to concentrate on what's occurring at the road. And we want to chase the problem backwards. If we start looking backwards, we see the segregation and start going through these common causes backwards out on the road then all the way back to the plant and then past the plant to the stockyards, it's usually, you're usually going to find it. What's causing the problem. So the most common cause on the roadway is exposing the conveyors in the hopper and then folding the hopper wings. When I told you to remember that picture of end of load segregation, this is what causes it. So we, out on the roadway, we'll, we'll run the paver empty and expose those slot conveyors and then we'll fold the wings. So the material on the outside of the wings is always colder and it's segregated. Our asphalt has a tendency for the larger aggregate to roll to the outside of the hopper. And if we put that mix straight down on those slack conveyors, then it's going to go through the back to the auger. And then that mix is cold and it's coarse. 
and it has a tendency to not be fluid and go down the auger. So it's going to end up in the middle of the mat and give you that chevron design right in the middle of the mat or what they refer to as end of load segregation. So we want to be mindful. If we're seeing that chevron design in the middle of our mat, let's watch our paver operator and see if they're folding our wings, folding the wings with the slack conveyor showing. Also a common cause that the roadway is cold mix. Cold mixture, whether it's one load, middle of the load or part of the load, the street has a tendency to drop and drag that mix and it'll separate the mix and it causes segregation. We want to be mindful of our mix temperature. If we're, if we're, we discover that we're not folding the wings onto empty slack conveyors and let's look for some cold mix. Our street angle. I'll talk about this in a little bit, but our, our uh, angle of our screen or angle of attack, it's called, if that's uh, not pro uh, set properly, it can also cause texture issues with the mat. Equipment maintenance. Um, on the bottom of our screen, we have uh, a screen plate, and if it tends to wear, if they do tend to wear out, and we have holes in it, it can also catch a hold of the the asphalt mat and drag it and segregate the mix. Um, our auger maintenance needs to be upkept. Our slack conveyors, just you know, total ma maintenance in the in the paver. We need to have good maintenance to ensure that we're not going to segregate segregate the mix. Our head of material at the auger. We have too much um, auger in the. And I'll put this next one up because it's kind of kind of the same. But the head of material at the auger, we overfeed or starve the screen we can cause issues with segregation in the mat or at least texture issues. And then that can lead to, you know, investigation that, that uh, points out segregation. Failure to preheat the paver screen. This, this can be proper. Hey, you know, everyone's got a job to do and, and we forget to, to preheat that screen before we're paving. Um, that cold screen, when it hits that hot asphalt, it is, it'll drop and drag the mat and, and really segregate the mix. Um, you would think that that's just an automatic thing to do, but I've seen it happen a number of times in my experience. We need to make sure that that's preheated. That can really cause a problem with segregating the mix. Stopping the paver between trucks. So if we don't have enough trucks and we're stopping for a, a prolonged period of time, the mixture can get cold. And if, again, like I talked about up at the, the top bullet there with cold mix, it's gonna, the screen's gonna drop and it's gonna drag the mix. Um, also, we can cause other texture issues in the mat from just stopping the paper for long periods of time or even short periods of time. In a perfect world, we'd have plenty of trucks and we'd be continuous paving all the time, but we need to uh, use the proper method of stopping the paver in between trucks and we'll talk about that. Also improper haul truck loading. This is uh, moving into the plant now. We need to make sure that we're loading these trucks correctly. Um, a minimum of three drops and using the, the slot method where we put a load in the front of the truck, a load back by the tailgate, and then a slot load in the middle. Three drops. This really helps. If we uh, we use two drops or one drop, which is, you know, not, highly not recommended. The mix can really segregate. But if we're using, you know, three drops and we're slot loading it, it really prevents some segregation. Again, we're back at the plant. A malfunctioning batch or a top of your silo. These are really important. We found a lot, a lot of times that segregation of the plant can be caused by the batch or whether, whether it's a door hanging up are hanging open and just letting the mix free fall from the top all the way to the bottom of the silo. Um, your larger particles of aggregate separate from your smaller particles and cause some se severe segregation. Also, you know, that batcher timing, if, if we're not letting that batcher get completely full before it opens and drops into the silo, that can also cause some issues with segregation. So malfunctioning batcher can, it's really something to look for. We're getting segregation at the plant. Excessive slack conveyor rate. So that slack conveyor carrying the mix from the drum up to the silos, if it's, if it's not timed correctly with the tons per hour of the plant, that uh, slack 
conveyor can outrun the mix and the mix can you know fall over the back of the slack conveyors and down the and down the conveyor and cause segregation of the mix it's too slow can build up and cause the same issue drum mixer or mixing drum buildup so inside your drum mixer you have flights if we get too much buildup on the flights it can cause the mix to to pile up and spill over the larger aggregate spilling over and segregating from the smaller aggregate also where the drum mixer um, discharges out onto the conveyor we get build up in there the mix can get held back the fine mix can my, the finer particles can get held back and the larger particles or the coarse aggregate can spill over and come out first and cause us some real problems with segregation another common problem at the asphalt plant cross contamination in the feed bins um you know bless their hearts our, our loader drivers we depend on them so much but every now and again they get they get busy doing other things and and we can get the wrong aggregate put in the bin or we get a bin too full and it spills over to a, to the next bin and we get a mixture of coarse aggregate into the fine aggregate or fine aggregate in the coarse aggregate can cause segregation so we want to be mindful of that our stockpile co-mingling uh, we don't have plenty of room to keep separated stockpiles or, or if you're using bulkheads if we get too much aggregate and we get piled up against those bulkheads and it spills over that's a that's a big cause of, uh, of segregation at the plant we think we're putting in one size aggregate when we're actually putting in a mixture of a couple aggregates into a single bin so let's talk a minute about some inspection practices of what we should be doing to look for segregation um, here in Florida of course um, they have a real good pavement texture specification it kind of gives the QC as well as the verification technician the, the or the department representative or the owner's representative out on the roadway what should be occurring to help prevent the segregation um, I don't know the state you're in have a segregation spec but this is this is a very good spec and it and it tells us what to do to use density gauges infrared temperature measurement devices or even roadway course to see if we're getting density if problem with segregation is that we have a tendency to not get density especially in the course part of the segregation and so you know we want to do that <clears throat> at truck exchanges and during normal paving operations so it's an ongoing thing we we want to continually inspect these uh these areas to see if we're getting segregation talk about some of the tools um out there on the roadway the quality control technician they all have uh, density gauges and it's a great way to indicate whether you're not getting density if you get a severe drop in density you might want to start looking around at the paving mat and see if it's segregated also just monitoring the temperature with uh, one of these infrared temperature guns segregation will really show up uh, you'll get a severe drop in your temperature behind the screen where normally you might you got a 300 uh 300 or 310 uh degree uh, mixture and all of a sudden your temperature behind the screen is is uh, dropping like to 250 degrees or or even less <clears throat> you might have a segregation issue or a thermal segregation issue as opposed to the normal normally you should get about you know 285 or 290 behind that screen so that's a real good tool and they're really inexpensive to invest in to look for segregation Follow the quality control specs and plus inspect. This is at the plant. We want to inspect our loading operation. We talked about <clears throat> the multiple drops into the load to make sure that we're using that slot load. So we want, really want to look at the uh, loading operation. We want to work, look at our batcher operation. <clears throat> Dale, we talked about that. You know, we got a batcher door hanging open. We can see that. If, if that's occurring, we need to get that fixed. We need to stop. Or if we're not getting a full batcher before it's dispensing into the silo. So those are <clears throat> easy things to inspect that we really need to pay attention to because those can cause some segregation. 
all transfer points and the slats. So like I was talking about the transfer points where they discharge from the mixing drum onto the slat conveyor. Look at the slats even going up the conveyor, make sure we're not piling that mix up or, or we have some that are even broken. Even up to, up top of the transfer, up on the top of the silo, the transfer slat. Look at those slats, make sure there's not a lot of buildup on those. The drum mixer area buildup weekly, you know, we want to look at this and make sure we're not getting that buildup on the slats or the, uh, the flights and at the discharge points. Make sure we're not getting that buildup. It's, uh, it's a tough job to do, but we need to pay attention to that and get that stuff chipped out if we're getting built up. You're dealing with a batch plant or we look at we need to look at the pug mill tips and the shanks on a weekly basis make sure they're all there as well as we're not getting built up look at our cold feed bins need to make sure that you know we have the right aggregate in those bins and that they're functioning properly they're opening to the right opening that we uh, we uh we want them to also that we're not bridging any of our fine material any of our natural sand or the screens make sure we don't have a bridge and and uh, starving material to the uh, to the belt. Also, want to look at our stockpiles. Take a look, visual look at them. Make sure you don't have any cross contamination of the stockpile. Make sure they look uniform. You know that you know we have a single size aggregate in that pile. Very important that we look at those stockpiles. Incoming aggregates. We want to test those incoming aggregates. So, uh, most states have a have a plan or a, a specification that requires a, a certain uh, amount coming in. I know Florida is every thousand tons. You might even do it every 500 tons just to make sure that you don't have a segregation within that single size aggregate of your incoming aggregate. It's very important. We we found a lot of segregation in uh, in the incoming aggregates by you know doing multiple tests and and paying attention to it. So with the asterisks up there, those are the most common causes of plant segregation problems. The batcher operation, the drum mixer buildup area, and also for the batch plant, the pug mill tips and shanks. And, you know, we really want to pay attention, we want to pay attention to everything, but primarily those three things can really cause us some issues for segregation at the plant. So prevention, so some prevention at the roadway, so proper planning, we want to balance the paving operation and have sufficient, a sufficient amount of trucks. Like we talked before, you know, we stop that, have to stop that paving train. Um, we we uh, stand a chance of the mix getting cold and segregating that mix. We want to set the paver speed so that density can be achieved. So if we have a slight segregation problem, but not a severe one, if we're if, if we're going slow enough where we can get density, then we, we probably have a chance for that mix to make it. Might not look great, but we have sufficient density. So, you know, we have to give the mixture a chance to make it through its lifetime out on the road just by achieving density. So we want to set that paver speed slow and steady. Assure trucks are clean and in good working order. We don't want build up in the back of those trucks on the tailgate area, especially. We make sure that all those trucks, and that's that's back at the plant primarily to pre-inspect those trucks. But again, when they dump out on the roadway, either into the MTV or directly into the hopper, you know, it doesn't take much for someone to look up there and make sure that uh, truck bed's clean. Monitor our mix temperature. We have uh, suspect that our temperature, that our, our uh, mixture is getting cold and causing some segregation. We might want to monitor the mix even more before it's even dumped into the MTV or the paver hopper, but really monitor it on the mat. You know, you have that little infrared temperature gun. Like I say, they're inexpensive and it's a great tool to recognize possible segregation. Want to load that paver hopper properly. We don't want to trickle mix from the haul truck into the into the paver hopper. We want to raise that truck bed, let the mixture shift towards the back of the tailgate, pop that tailgate, and then flood the hopper. 
We do, definitely don't want to trickle mix. If we would trickle mix, we'll get a severe segregation problem with the, uh, the coarse aggregate coming out before the fine aggregate and segregating and getting down in the bottom of the hopper, which we don't want. So we want to maintain a one third to two third full hopper volume at all times. So we don't want to let that hopper run empty during our paving process. Keep it a third to two thirds full. And then we can fold the wings a little bit at that time. As long as we have material in the bottom of that hopper, we can fold the wings in a little bit and keep that mix live and even kind of work some of that outside in to a more homogeneous mix that's in between and uh, it'll prevent segregation. So maintain that hopper volume. Don't want to run the hopper empty again, a constant head of material, the auger, and the auger, and keep the auger ends full. So with that hopper being one third to two third, then we're going to keep a constant head of material. So we're going to keep the, the flow rate going back to the auger and keeping it, uh, keeping the constant head of material. Especially out on those auger ends, um, we, we want to keep our, our low flow indicators working so that we're constantly get mix out, especially if we got an extended gate on the side of our screed. If we don't keep it out there and keep it full, then the mix will tumble to the outside. The coarse aggregate will tumble over the finer aggregate and we'll get segregation towards the outside of our mat. Avoid folding the wings when the slack conveyor is exposed. You might notice that we're repeating that because this has been a major problem. So we, uh, something you really want to pay attention to. We don't want to fold those wings when the slack conveyors are exposed. Again, it's going to cause end-of-load se se end segregation. It's going to cause it every time. Keep the paver moving at a steady speed. Like I said, you know, slow and just keep it moving. The less stops we have, the better. If we do have to stop, we want to make it sure it's a hot stop. A hot stop is make sure we have a, a one third to two thirds of full hopper and also a full head of material at the auger and also underneath the street as well. So we have a lot of asphalt in there to keep everything nice and warm or hot while we're waiting for the next truck to show up. So it's a hot stop. We don't want to keep moving, empty the hopper and, you know, and lower the material at the uh, auger. So an MTV is not required by all owners and agencies. I know here in Florida, they do not require it, but using one will help your field operation produce a smooth, uniform texture. So it's gonna help us in keeping that mix uh, warm, homogenous, and lessen the chance of segregation on the roadway. I won't say it will prevent it, but it's gonna lessen the chance. Thorough quality control throughout the operation. So we, we got some, we need some good QC people out there that, that know what they need to do and they continue to pay attention, you know, tracking the spread rates. If we keep a, keep a good monitor on our spread rates, we know that we're getting the right amount of mix down and we're probably not getting segregation or we have, you know, the right flow through the, through the paver. So good, thorough quality control, you know, monitoring the temperatures and all that. Is really going to help us out in, in preventing segregation out on the roadway. So that's going to do it for me. And I'm going to turn it over to TJ as soon as I stop sharing my screen here. You there, TJ? I am trying to be. All right. Let me turn my camera back on. Oh my gosh, I'm there. Share my screen, get this going, and go live with this. Okay, so we're looking at prevention at the plant now. This is where they kicks it over to me. And Steve's talked about a lot of these things. I mean, what we've reviewed so far is a lot of best practice. Um, so troubleshooting really becomes a matter of seeing what best practice might have got violated or might have got corn you know cut a corner we want to make sure we load the trucks properly so this is a little bit of repeat of what steve's already talked about but um multiple drops are very important when you have that opportunity to do so 
square body trucks. My personal experience doing a lot of consulting work is, as I've seen even on 12 and a half millimeter mixes, I've seen pay factors improved in multiple states. Uh, usually this is a big fight because everybody goes, oh, 12 and a half millimeter mix, half inch mix, not a problem. But when you're chasing pay factors and you're looking at mixed consistency, I've demonstrated personally with my own experience in like three different states where if we, we properly socket load or slot load these trucks, get them to load against the bulkhead, then load in the middle, actually the consistency of the mix improves. And where we're in a PWL state, we'll, we'll see a pay factor bump. Make sure the batchers are functioning correctly. Steve already talked about it. You're seeing that asterisk again, the last slide, the last little you know, blow through on this slide is gonna talk about how these are kind of the key items. I like to think in terms of 80-20 rules and 80% of the time, if there's a problem with segregation and it's plant generated, it's in my experience, it's been in the batcher. So like Steve already enumerated, are we getting a full batch? Um, is the batcher gate staying open too long to where it trickle feeds the silo? And the whole idea of a batcher is that it collects a, a gob of material. A lot of states have written their specifications around gob hoppers. Some of the manufacturers still call them gob hoppers. So you're, you're collecting a mass of material, going to drop it in mass into the silo. The whole idea of doing that is make sure that that batcher that gate is not open too long, otherwise you're gonna be trickle feeding the silo. So you have a full batch at all production rates. Or is the gate closing in time? More often than not, the problem is really a hole in the gate, hole in the side of the batcher, or a gate that's hung up, or you may have one air cylinder that is having a, a, you know oiler problem and it's delaying the close of the gate. So this is why we call for that as, as a uh, kind of a daily inspection item. The crews that I help manage, I'm like, I want those guys on top of that silo watching those batchers operate every single day. This is really important. This 80% of the time, if there's a plant problem with segregation, it's usually in the batcher. So batcher should be filled completely with your production rate. We also wanna look at our slat speed. Now, a lot of slats now, a lot of the plants have built in the last 10 years have got variable frequency drives on their slat conversion. What a variable frequency drive does, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, is it turns a constant speed motor into a variable speed motor. And it does this by varying the, varying the frequency of, of the current to the, to the motor. So you can match with these kind of plants, you can match your slat speed kind of with your production rate. So like Steve said, you don't want material, you're feeding so much material into the slat that it can't keep up with production, which rolls back over the top of the batcher, which can cause some segregation right in the slat conveyor. Uh, if you go too fast, um, and particularly if you're running a, a stone heavy mix, a gap graded mix, an SMA type mix, an open graded friction course type mix, you can actually uh, chuck the material to the far side of the batcher or the transfer point if the slats running too long. Um, and this is kind of a key point because in the troubleshooting guide that we're going to sort of introduce to you at the end of this program, one of the things you want to think about doing is, is looking at sampling both sides of the truck or, or trying to sample, sample the material, see if it, it's actually coming apart. So you can do that by putting too fast, too high rate of a, a production of a slat conveyor in your operation. Want to avoid buildup in the mixing drum. This would be the other 20% um, usually at a plant. Now these percentages are not you know, firm, but when, when a guy tells me he's got a batch uh, segregation, he thinks it's plant induced since I'm the plant geek. I'm like, look at your batchers first and then see if you got buildup in the mixing drum or the mixing chamber, or as Steve said, the chute coming out of that device. So any dam that gets created in the mixing device, whether it's an outside pug mill mixer, it's a, a straight drum where it's all being done in one process, or it's a, a drying drum with a mixing drum, any opportunity for a hump 
in that material or, or a dam in that material can, as Steve very explained it very, very well, it'll, it'll back the fines up and let the coarse material come over the top. So I always look at the batch run, look at the, the mixing area is, is the key thing. Of course, if it's a batch plant, you don't have a mixing drum or you don't have a drum mixer or, or, or a continuous pug mill. What you've got is a batching type pug mill and, and that condition is very important. The tips, the shanks, the paddle pattern is all very important. Remember, machines wear out. And this is something we really could have said at the beginning of the program. Plants a machine, conveyor, you know, MTV's machine, pavers a machine, machines wear. Steve talked about wear at the pavers, wear in the, in the shuttle buggies or the, or the material transfer devices. Uh, drums are going to wear out, flights are going to wear out, buildup is going to occur, maintenance is, is critical. Monitor your feed vents for cross contamination. I won't elaborate on this because Steve talked about it really well. Uh, you want to manage your best practices for all your stockpile. You know, we talked about that. So, so these are the prevention techniques. So these are activities that if you do will help reduce the likelihood of segregation from occurring. The unfortunate point here is that we all experience segregation at some point in time. So everything's going along hunky-dory 99% of the time, but you're going to have a problem. So if you manage these activities, if you manage the equipment, you're going to minimize your risk of, of things going sideways on you. Again, that asterisk most common causes are are right up there in the mixing area or in the batcher. So, so we, what if, what are we going to do if we find that we have segregation on your project? This is kind of broken down into three ways. If you notice it during paving, the key point here is communication. I mean, the, the takeaway from this set of slides at the end is communication. And you should have heard that all the way along, communicating about what's in your stockpile, communicating about testing the stockpile, you know, knowing what you're feeding into the plant, uh, QC and the plant people talking to each other. So if you're out there on the road, you're gonna see it in the road. <clears throat> and we're gonna look backwards to figure out where that occurred. So you wanna notify your QC and your paving foreman, hey, we got a problem here. You wanna contact your plant. We got a problem out here. Why don't you guys start looking? We're looking out here. Let's figure out where it's coming from, okay? Have QC on the roadway, start checking behind the screen on truck exchanges. If you don't have a person at that point, at this point in time, get a body over there, take a look at, like Steve was talking about, is there a pattern here? Is it load to load segregation? Are there temperature issues going on? Do we have density issues? You have some texture issues, pop some density, non-destruct density numbers on there. Try to figure out if we are in fact dealing with a segregation issue. Remind QC to monitor as required to the spec. So each owner agency has got their own kind of list of things to do. Um, fancy term, but I call it investigative behavioral activities. I mean, what's <laughs> what these kind of, so what Steve was talking about, I mean, kind of what this, what these specs are doing is saying, okay, we got a problem. Here's your investigative behavioral activity. Do these things. And a lot of times there is a requirement for that owner agency. They're, they're giving you a guidance of saying, look, you have a problem, go here. So we got to follow the specifications of the agency that we're working for. Now, if you notice it after your paving shift, now why would you do that? Well, a lot of us are paving at night. I mean, the great thing about asphalt is that we can pave at night. It'll set up, we can stripe it, turn it out to the public the next morning. So this is a huge advantage to asphalt, but in the light of day, it's a great idea to ride the map when the sun comes up. And if you find a problem, you might not have noticed it in the dark of the night, but you're gonna see it in that low light of morning. So what if you see segregation on your project after the paving shift? Again, communication's a key. Notify the owner agency, get lane and station locations and start communicating with, with the production people 
in the company that laid the math. Now, if you've got a really tough situation here, you've got to ask yourself, should we stop the operation? That's a tough, tough decision. But I think it's worth highlighting the slide by saying, look, it's all of our responsibilities if we discover we have a problem to ask the question, should we continue on or should we find the cause of the problem? And the answer to that is fairly intuitive. So once we decide that we've got a situation here and it's segregation related, the key, like we said earlier in the program, and hopefully this is a valuable takeaway from this presentation, just chase it backwards. You've seen it in the road, could have been in the hopper, like Steve said, could have been the temperature of the mix, could have been we were starving the, the paver, could have been we didn't do the augers right, but chase it backwards, even if you've got to come all the way back to the plant operation and, and the stockpiles. Now we have a handout that Molly's going to make available for you to download that actually gives you a punch list on chasing it backwards. So it's a nice three page little handout. So you can actually use this technique and just go on backwards. The value of this, I think, or we feel is, is that it gives you a punch list. So now we've gone through this whole program. We've enumerated what all these points are that it could be it could happen here, this could happen, could be a best practice, a bad practice, could be an equipment issue, but having a punch list where you can actually just tick it off backwards becomes what we feel is pretty valuable and we wanna make that available to you. So this is actually what you're gonna find in that handout. At the paver, you know, it failure to fold the hopper wings, failure to keep the ends of the cross screw full during paving. All the stuff that we've talked about, maintaining the depth of the material. So at the paver, we have these items during truck loading, these things possibly happening, okay? At the batcher, again, we talked about the batchers a lot because it's kind of 80-20 rule. Here's your bullet points to look for in the batcher. If you think it's batcher related, if it's in the slack conveyor, these are the things to look for at the slack conveyors. If it's in the the mixing area of the plant on a, on, a, on a drum mixer type plant. You know, look at these items, we've talked about it, but it get, again, it gives you bullet points to look for and, and actually take it to the field. So the value of the handout is it becomes a, a document that can go to the field with you and everybody can huddle up around it. You can do a little take five meeting. You can talk about these points and it gives you some talking points to work with rather than saying go on the ATS website and, and look at this recorded message. Although I'm sure Molly's going to have that available through the ATS website also and, and you can review this. So if it's not in the mixing device, go look at the feed bins, go look in the stockpiles, go all the way back to the quarry. This is why verifying the gradation as it comes into the plant becomes so important and a lot of agencies you know, have that specification. The last thing we need to talk about is clinkers. Um, clinkers are sometimes referred to as dinosaur eggs. Um, here's a, a picture of one. And what are these really? Well, this is the result of our continuous mix plants that 95% of the production in the United States comes from. It's a buildup of fines and binder in the mixer or the slack conveyor at the plant that become dislodged during production. So you're running along just fat, dumb, and happy. Everything is great, and one of these dinosaur eggs shows up. And if they're large enough, you know, the inspection people are going to see them. They're going to remove them from the mat. But if we have a lot of them occur, you know, we need to, again, communicate we got an issue here. So our clinkers or dinosaur eggs or chunks, is that a segregation issue? Well, yeah, it is, because it can permanently affect the life of the pavement at the point where these get rolled into the mat. Now, if they're large enough, they're gonna cause problems 
you know, with the, with the screed. One of the things that I want to stress on these clinkers from a plant perspective is that one of the common causes of these things is, is generally two things. Either the plant mixing area is not being cleaned out frequently enough or the slack conveyors frequently enough, okay? And as the material builds up, builds up, builds up, builds up, then it eventually just shucks itself loose. Or the other common problem for those of us that run high percentages of recycle, we're typically heating our aggregate up to 700, 800, 900, 1,000 degrees, depending on the wrap percentage that you run. And if the wrap bin plugs up, even a short period of time and you lose feed, the temperature in the mixing area spikes because you've got this super hot aggregate going through the plant. The wrap has been starved back momentarily, caused a shock wave of heat to go into that mixing area. And that heat will dislodge the buildup that's on the mixing tips and the, and the flights and at the transfer points and, and on the slats and the slack conveyor. So over a period of say three or four more loads, you're gonna see a lot of material clean itself out of the plant. So this is particularly problematic. It's common, it's not discussed a lot. In fact, we're discussing a lot of things here that you know we know exists that, that we really don't like to talk about, but we've all experienced this at, at some point in time. Now, keep in mind in that first bullet point up here that if I get my mouse back, and I'm not sure I can, but this buildup on the slack conveyors and these corners can also occur in the MTVs and, and the pavers. So, so don't rule that out. So plant and MTV equipment maintenance is indicated here, okay, if we, if we see uh, clinkers. And so the idea is to come up with a, with a routine time where you know your plant needs to be cleaned out. The more frequent the starts and stops, the more frequent, the quickly they build. The high, high, higher modified uh, binders with polymer and high polymer have a tendency to build up more quickly than, than neat binders do. If, and so, so there is, this varies from region to region, locale, locale, plant to plant, and, and the way the plants are being operated. So you have to find your balance of when you want to do your own cleaning. So again, we come back on this clinker. This is what it's going to look like if it gets rolled into the mat and then it comes out. And if they end up in the middle of the mat and they're not seen, you know, they, they can pop off and cause a raveling issue, which, which can affect, you know, the long-term pavement length. That's not what we're looking for, obviously. And so that's another thing we, we need to add to the list. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and give it back to Molly, I guess. Um, and uh, any questions or discussion that you guys wanna do, we're trying to be thorough. And for one thing, we wanted to enumerate everything that best practice and prevention points, but then we also wanted to give you you know, a handout where you can use it as a checklist. So a little summary there. Molly, it's yours. Thanks. Thanks, DJ. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Oops, sorry. I got some feedback coming from somewhere. Um, okay, we have a couple of questions here to go over. Um, so we have about 10 minutes or so. If anybody else has a question, feel free to raise your hand or type it in the Q&A box. So Steve, this one looks like it's more directed for you. For monitoring the mixed temperature at the paving train, can you offer some safe and effective methods for checking the temperature in the hull truck, the hopper, at the head of material, anywhere else? Um, for the hull truck and the hopper, of course, the hopper is a very dangerous area to be. You, you really don't want to be checking temperature of the mix in the hopper unless the truck is completely cleared away from the paver the paver stationary, and then you could reach in there with a quick read, you know, uh, dial thermometer to check the temperature in the hopper. But we wanna make sure there's no trucks around. I mean, that's just a pinch point that you don't wanna be involved in. As far as the haul truck itself, um, I know the Florida DOT, they have a requirement that they have a hole in both sides of the truck. So traffic side, as well as the other side, 
the ideal side is be a, away from the traffic side and with a quick read thermometer stick stick into the uh to the body of the truck into the into the mixture you know you want to go in at least 12 inches and, and check that temperature there's not a real good way at the auger the best way is to is to check it when it comes out from behind the screen with an infrared temperature gun you know you of course you're just getting the surface but it's giving you a pretty good indication if you're getting a big temperature drop so if i check my truck i'm at 310 ideally right behind the screen i should be 290 or above if i'm getting a big temperature drop it's an indication that I might have some segregation but also you want to do that on the non-traffic side of the map with an infrared gun okay thank you Steve and TJ, can you each give an example of a time you encountered segregation, Steve at the road, TJ at the plant, how you identified it and corrected it on the job? Um, since we've been moving backwards, Steve, why don't you start with an example out on the roadway? Um, yeah, I've had a couple of indications where I've been on site and uh, end of load segregation was occurring or load to load segregation, however you want to define it. But and it's the the classic where you start looking you you look at what the paver operators doing and they weren't using an mtv and every time a, a truck pulled away they continued running the hopper and and getting lower and lower and lower to the slat conveyors were exposed and then folding the wings and it was just a tall tail pattern um i've also seen where cold mix uh, occurs where you get a, a, a for whatever reason you get a cold mix a cold load of asphalt and it segregates and you know the the corrective method for the for the end of load segregation is hey don't run the hopper empty if, if we got a cold mixture we can't tint or cold mix we we can't temp every truck but and at that point if it goes down it's kind of too late but if we keep with our with our regular temperature frequencies that the FDOT or your DOT or your owner agency has described, it'll give you a good indication if the temperature's dropping or if the temperature's rising, you know, that that type of deal. So EJ? I turn? Yeah. Okay, the one that would come to my mind um, just happened recently for us is we, we get a call uh, from the paver and they're like, uh, uh, we think we have some segregation here and we're only uh, laying nine and a half millimeter mix. So we have three eighths mix, nine and a half millimeter mix. We're, we're, we're in a subdivision and a lot of people say, oh, you know, you can't segregate that kind of mix. Well, yeah, you can. Uh, we started chasing it backwards. So immediately the guys, we got the call, we're not believing it course and uh, we go to the top check the batchers out checks make sure they're full batches make sure the timers are not running empty and the guys are working their way backwards again um, looking at the inspection shoot we had a new guy on the job uh, for a week or so he wasn't being communicating we weren't communicating very effectively with him and we had some buildup in the shoot that was coming from the drum you know into the slat so the so it was backing up in the mixing area and it, and the larger rocks were rolling over like steve was explaining the you eventually get a mass of material and it kind of blurps out and so it was legitimately a plant issue on a mix that rarely sees segregation um, and it just illustrates the point how how important it is to uh keep the the mixing area clean okay thank you yeah, you had one of the points you made, TJ, or questions you asked, you know, when do you shut down your operation when you're encountering segregation? So if you did find a problem, um, maybe in the drum or the batcher is one of the more common places at the plant, how long, if you do have to shut down the operation before typically you can get up and running again? Oh, I'm sure the so answer your is real it question depends. is how quick you can get running again or or if you or have to shut do do? down I mean yeah well if if we do shut down that's when everybody gets nervous I mean they're just everybody's freaking out so the first thing you start doing is checking the other trucks that are going out and you get QC involved and like what are we going to do what are we going to do if you do shut down um you're going to run through about an hour's worth of inspection and then in this case, like we found we had a shoot problem. 
it only takes about an hour to clean that out. And then we can go to another silo, make some more mix, check it, you know, and carry on, right? Um, so it really, that's kind of a loaded question because if you're on a DOT job, I mean, you might want to call the shift, call it out. Now, Steve and I like to do a lot of trial batches. So if we think we have a problem, we might pull the shift for the day, lick our wounds. Once we get over being nervous, we'll probably see if we found a problem with the plant. If we found a problem with the plant and we think we did, we can fire up and make, you know, 80 tons of mix, waste one or two loads, check the third one, see if it looks good, check the, the visual in the trucks. You never want to look at the first load coming out of a cone um, and, and, and then make a decision if you're going to carry on it or, or not. So it's, it's, it's a tough deal. Uh, we all get there occasionally, unfortunately. That's the point of this whole program. Yep, the biggest takeaway seems to be proactive in all the preventative measures that you guys covered earlier. Um, and as TJ said, we'll have the troubleshooting handout available on our website under education and our virtual road trip tab. I will also email it to all of you with the link to a recording of this webinar. So thanks again for attending today. We hope you found the webinar valuable. Our next session, our next trip, will be March 22nd. So we have a little bit of a break here. We'll be doing a National Balance Mix Design Update with Travis Welbeck of NCAT. And since this is an ATS platform, I do have to remind you, we have our um, Asphalt Binder Lab open house February 17th. If you'd like to see the details and attend that, you can visit our website, www.asphalttesting.info forward slash open house. You can find all of the details there. It's gonna be quite the event. So we hope you can all make it. And thanks again. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, TJ. Got a couple thank yous coming in on the Q&A. So good to see you guys. Glad you were here. And um, we'll talk to you all soon. See you in March. Thanks, everyone. See you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.